it is so great to see this room so full of people that are interested in thinking about the intersection of AI and education. It's uh, why I'm happy I'm back at Stanford. So uh, I, well, I'm Candace Till. I'm currently an associate professor in the Graduate School of Age Education uh, since February 1st, two weeks ago. Um, now, uh, but, but this is my return to Stanford because for the five years prior, I was an assistant professor in the Graduate School of Education until 2018 when I left and spent five years being the director of learning science at Amazon. And what I was doing there is essentially what we're talking about here, taking what we know about human learning and uh, what was happening in the AI and technology space and thinking about how do you build the technical infrastructure and processes that accelerate learning internal to Amazon. So it was just Amazon employees. So um, now I'm back and I'm gonna be bringing what I learned from that experience um, and learning from all of you to think about how we uh, build that infrastructure and apply those learnings more broadly. And so today we're gonna be focusing on AI enriched classrooms. And our panel in our pre-panel discussion decided to take a little liberty and broaden the idea of classroom. Uh, probably evokes a mental image of students sitting in front of, 35 students sitting in front of a teacher and that's not how we think about classrooms anymore. So we'll be talking about AI-enriched classrooms from pre-K through adult learning in the workplace. Uh, and to do that, we have a great panel. Um, uh, so our first uh, uh, panelist is Brian Brown, who is a professor of science education and formerly a high school science teacher. His research explores how language and cognition impact science learning. His current work examines how digital tools have the potential to improve student learning and enhance their desire to participate in careers in science. Our second panelist is Sarah Levine. Uh, she's an assistant professor in the Graduate School of Education and also a former high school teacher, but her focus was English. And she's interested in ways that AI and digital media can be used as frameworks for teaching reading and writing to middle and high school students. And our final panelist is Emma Brunskill, who is a professor of computer science. She's also currently co-chair of the International Conference of Machine Learning. And her goal is to create AI systems that learn from limited data to robustly make good decisions inspired by applications to education. Also, I want to just note, Emma, Emma used to be at Carnegie Mellon when I was at Carnegie Mellon, and then I came to Stanford, and then uh, Emma came to Stanford. So <laughs> I, didn't, uh, I didn't manage to convince her to go to Amazon with me, but so I'm back at Stanford. Anyway, so um, welcome. So the, our format's going to be a little different than this morning's format. Uh, we're doing no slides uh, and just doing a little five-minute intro. Uh, each person will make a five-minute intro comment. And then um, we want to have most of the time for dealing with uh, conversation and questions generated by humans. <laughs> okay, so um, we'll start with Brian. So the rules of the rules of discourse. I, I'm a teacher at heart, and so when I ask a question, it is not rhetorical. I actually want an answer. Uh, so I want to start by saying there's a, a teacher's dilemma. I, I'll put my let me just do some some therapy for myself. I started teaching at 21 years old. They turned over a room of 30 kids to me and said, go teach them. Every hour, they gave me another room mm -hmm. of 30 kids. It was not the same kids. It was a different set of kids. Um, that was my teacher's dilemma. So I, I want to talk about uh, a principle, and here's the principle, that I believe what we know about learning does not reflect it in how we teach. So here's my first question. When did you forget all the phone numbers that were in your head? Mm -hmm. I got to set my timer. So answer that. Someone, someone give it to me pretty quickly. I only have five minutes. That's my point, Dylan. You know where I'm going with this. Is that, is that Dylan? I'm looking at you. I don't know. Or somebody behind you. But here's the deal. You remember that, oh, I'm in trouble phone number, but you forgot all of those other ones because the computers on our, our shoulders are highly efficient. We remember the things that are, have value and repetition equals retention. You remember 
the terrible songs that you heard often, but the power of explaining produces understanding, it produces uh, retention. So when you're in a classroom, uh, I believe it was Dora Dembski noted, who was doing all the talking? Teacher. Therefore, who knows the content? Teacher. Any of you who had to teach, you firmly understand that something was very powerful about needing to explain it so someone else understood it. So going back to the principle, teachers know uh, learning happens not when I'm talking, but when I can produce powerful discussion for my students. Therefore, one of the true benefits of the potential of AI is not in what it can explain, but what it can produce in how students are able to explain ideas. I want to stop and leave that right there. It's called formative assessment. Uh, we'll, if you want to read about it, we'll, William and Black talk about inside the black box and how powerful it is to really master formative assessment. But here's the challenge. If I ask a student a question, my teacher's dilemma, how many students can respond? One, and then we play guess what's in my head. Correct. Oh, no, that's wrong, right? Given that instructional conversations are rude, right? I would never ask you a question on the street, and then when you get it wrong, I would say, no, that's <laughs> not the right answer. Okay. Instructional conversations are intended to produce context-driven discussion and analysis. I want the students to do the talk. This is, I'm going a long way to get to where I think AI is incredibly powerful. If I get the students to talk about the ideas that are meaningful for them, meaningful for them three things will happen. Ah, I got it. Oh, damn, I don't understand that at all, right? Or I understand this part, and this other part is unclear. All are phenomenal places to be. Teachers know this, and so what they do is they create embedded formative assessments. Lots of opportunities for students to talk about their ideas. But in that space, they then get really creative. So let me give you an example. If I'm a, I'm a science teacher, I teach biology. If I'm teaching about the water cycle, I might ask students, hey, you took a shower before, right? And everyone's going to say, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you ever notice there's water on the mirror? Where did the water come from? It didn't jump through the shower. Where did it come from? The students will give you an answer. And in that process, I either know what I know, I know what I don't know, or I know I know this part and this other part is unclear. I've got them where I want them. Because now I have them thinking about the, what the right answer is. So sometimes students will say, well, the water was in the air. It is condensation. Now, at one layer, is that a right answer or not a right answer? You tell me. You, you, you see the hesitancy in your voice? You have no confidence that that's the right or the wrong answer. And I don't care either. It's irrelevant. But what I can now do is ask them the question that generates their thinking. Was there water in the air? If so, how did it change form? What, what produced the change? The point is conversation produces understanding. And as a teacher, my dilemma is I'm one person trying to generate 30 conversations. And there's a whole nother layer. Those who want to speak will speak, but those who don't want to speak will not speak. We have lots of cultural and gender bias that happens. And as a teacher, I, I, I need to make sure I do this. Now, right now, let me tell you what teachers are learning to do. The pandemic taught them that the chat is powerful. I can now in teaching, because I was online, say, hey, tell me your answer in the chat produce an answer, and the teachers are evaluating real time. So I believe what we've learned from the first session is incredibly powerful. If we can create small formative assessment opportunities, and they're culturally powerful, and we'll talk about that later, we can produce lots of opportunities for students to explain and experience some real uh, confidence in this transition from I don't know it, it's a little bit fuzzy, to now I've mastered the concepts. Yep. <laughs> Yep, but in English, but in English language arts. Uh, so I'll just, I'll, I'll pick up where you left off. Let's see, I think I might not need this mic. I think I'm, my little lapel is working. Uh, hi, I'm Sarah. Um, I'm also at the GSE and I focus on the teaching and learning of English language arts. Um, and I think I'm just gonna focus today on the classroom as you're probably thinking about the classroom um, with a teacher and with a bunch of students. Uh, Brian's been talking about ways that kids can use this tool and teachers can use this tool um, to generate not content necessarily, but things that students can use to learn and reason. So uh, for me, I want to think about the potential for uh, something like a chatbot, chat GPT, to do a couple of things. 
First, this tool really is going to require teachers to rethink why they teach, what they teach, and how they teach it. And this is mostly a good thing. Uh, in, in some parts, that's because uh, we still in the classroom teach uh, pretty much the way we have taught for the last hundred years with some excellent uh, progress forward. Uh, but we are teaching, for the most part, our kids to create products that are pretty automated. Um, if you remember the essays that you were probably asked to write if you went to school in the U.S. or a Eurocentric system, the essays about the Great Gatsby, for example, whatever you're thinking of, that's the way we're teaching it pretty much right now. And that's the way we taught it 50 years ago. And if you think about the ways that teachers try to scaffold their kids when they try to support their kids writing, um, you'll see a lot of what looks like kind of automatic prose. Here's a sentence stem. In the novel X by X, the author tries to X, which has the effect of X. So we oftentimes, never mind Chat GPT, we are giving our kids all sorts of kind of um, automated ways of communicating. Uh, this is a problem. In our classrooms, we are seeing writing not as a tool for thinking, but as a, a tool for a product. And kids really do see writing as the thing that you do after you've done all your thinking and all your talking. And now it's just a matter of getting down precisely what you learned or what the teacher said you were supposed to say. So I'd like to think about ChatGPT as a way of kind of disrupting that kind of writing, writing for product, not writing for process. There's a couple ways I think you can do that. I'm just going to go super narrow. One is I think that ChatGPT can act as an example machine. And this is something that teachers need and don't have time to create for themselves. So behind me, you'll see a bunch of examples that teachers can use to help kids begin to differentiate between different kinds of writing, different styles of writing. Uh, content that's reliable, different structures for persuasion, all of this stuff teachers can create with something like this chatbot. And it's, in, it's so time consuming to have to uh, sit down and write five first uh, paragraphs to a college essay, let's say, that you want to show your kids so that instead of you saying, look, here's a college essay, you write like this now, you say, here's five introductions for a college essay. Which do you think work? How do they work better and worse? Which language is more effective? To create those kinds of examples yourself takes, it could take a couple of hours. Instead, we'll get ChatGPT to do that. And I can tell the kids, here's these three sentences, which do you think is most effective and for what reasons? Now we're thinking about writing in terms of craft and content. Now, yes, we're asking kids to be editors uh, as much as they are generators. But because we're not asking our kids to do those things now, I think this tool can be really productive for students. So we've got uh, this idea that first ChatGPT is going to make us rethink, why am I asking my kids to basically fill in the blanks of a template to an essay about The Great Gatsby? How valuable is that? Uh, second, we're going to be able to use, I think, uh, something like this. And if you move to the next slide, you can see a few more examples. Um, for another kind of um, set of, uh, for another way of being an example machine. And that is that a lot of our teaching in the classroom right now asks that kids do tasks in a vacuum, write a thing, do a task. But in real life, when you are talking about something, you're talking about it because somebody else asked you a question or because there's a conversation being generated out in the world and you want to join it. Another thing that ChatGPT can do for individual kids that a teacher cannot do because they're in this dilemma about who they're going to respond to and how is give students an argument to respond to. So instead of a teacher saying, write an argument about the motif of the green light in The Great Gatsby and how it represents the American dream, done. <laughs> The teacher can say, you know, the bot here has this idea about what this light means. It's generated from a whole bunch of things online. So you respond to that. That's not cheating. 
that is developing a real authentic way of responding to an argument, just the way a person in the real world would. So I'm, I'm feeling optimistic about ChatGPT as a way to help kids become editors and evaluators as much as generators. And I'm feeling optimistic about ChatGPT's ability or capacity to support teachers to better teach their kids. And I'm also feeling, I've got some Eeyore too, and my teacher friends are scared. Uh, and there's some real dangers and we have to, we should talk about them right now. Uh, but for the most part, I think this tool is going to be pretty valuable and it's pretty exciting. Can I? Is this on? Okay, hey, great. Um, so I'm a, I'm a machine learning researcher and so I can't really speak to um, in depth about a particular area. So I thought I'd zoom out a little bit and think about some general three things that I think are really important to consider as we think about how AI might impact. So I'll start with um, a Tigger example to keep us optimistic where we've been so far. Um, and the first is that there's an enormous number of skills right now, which is re where it's really hard for us to teach people of them at all, or certainly to do so in an effective and efficient way. For example, LinkedIn, I think today, released um, their 2023 top skills that um, employers want. And over five of the 10 are soft skills. So things like leadership, teamwork, collaboration, um, these are really hard to do in this sort of learning by doing framework that we know is so effective because it requires real-time support, little groups of students talk and get feedback, and we just can't scale that up if there's one piece. But foundation models are soon going to enable that. So you could imagine a real-time agent as a speaker on each of those tables that's listening to the natural language being generated, providing real-time support and feedback so people can learn the soft skills. Uh, this is in addition to things like essay grading and many other skills that we've already talked about. I think there's an explosion of these new types of skills that we're going to be able to teach in a really effective way. I'm going to go for optimistic and pessimistic. Um, the second one is going to be in the middle. Um, I think that there's an opportunity um, that we would need to be really intentional about how these sort of foundation models increase or maintain productive struggle. So there's a nice quote that says, if it doesn't challenge you, it won't change you. And learning is hard. Anybody that's ever learned knows that it's not all fun and easy all the time. I have to motivate my nine-year-old to persist at fractions when it's hard. There are many, many settings where it's going to be all too easy for us to give up on productive work, to take the one second to write the three-page essay instead of the five hours that it would normally take. So I think there's going to be a huge temptation to try to outsource productive struggle and miss the opportunity to learn. On the other hand, I think there's an enormous opportunity. These sort of tutors, maybe a better version of Alfred, like Noah is showing us, could have growth mindset, infinitely patient. Again, as a parent, I am not infinitely patient. I would love to be. Um, but these things can be infinitely patient in helping someone persist. There's no face threat either to the student or to the teacher. Um, and I think that's a really powerful affordance that some of these could allow us to really increase in the productive struggle and really transform the classroom. The third thing I want to say is that I think it's really important that we don't outsource. Them. So we've been hearing about this tension this morning of what is going to be foundational to still have students learn versus what will go the way of the slide. I was at the AAAI conference last weekend and talking to a colleague of mine, Susan Murphy, over at Harvard. And she said, almost all of us have now lost the ability to tell time from the sky. We don't use the moon, we don't use the sun, we use our watches. And almost none of us feel like that's any better. On the other hand, for me to get to AAAI, I rode on an airplane, but I don't know how to design an airplane. I certainly don't know how to design a rocket ship that could take humanity to Mars. So I think as we think about how AI could be enabled, we need not just users of AI, but we need builders, we need storytellers need innovators. And so I want to make sure that when we're designing AI for education, that we use these foundation models in a way that allows the broadest swath of humanity to really contribute to human progress, as opposed to making this only part of the elite group. OK, so Emma, I wouldn't call that last comment pessimistic at all. <laughs> I would call it inspiring. Um, so um, to, to, to all of you, um, 
So what types of, like, like get a little concrete, more concrete, what types of educational experiences uh, might this make possible, uh, which are not yet possible? Like push the, we've been talking a lot this morning about pushing the innovation on the AI side. I want to hear about some innovation on the teaching and learning side. I'm happy to give it a shot. Um, please build for me a formative assessment wherein a student offers an answer. When they get it right, wrong, or they get part right, part wrong, that it understands not to think in binary, recognizes the wrong in the student. It affirms them. It's excellent. Glad you got this part right. And it gives them an example that drives their Imagine that what pops up is a, a video of the same example. Has anybody here lived in a place so cold? When you walk inside, your glasses get fogged. Condensation, I just gave you a new concept. I, I, I chose the shower example because I assumed everyone here had to take a shower, right? <laughs> a teacher takes examples that resonate. If an AI can do that, that's extraordinary because it helps them go and you, you can build the back end data, data analytics so that they can know which examples drive understanding quickly. Secondly, if science is a very peculiar place because if you get it wrong, we assume you're just not smarter. Uh, our, our inability to teach can be hid by our poor instruction. Uh, let me say that. We hide our poor instruction by the assumption that only the intellectual elite can understand science. As such, uh, if you don't understand it, you're not smart enough, so that creates a cultural issue. I would love for our technologies to do the inverse. We can produce stress and we produce affirmation. Confident, build that machine for me. I'm sure science is all over. Use it. I think another thing that AI can do is act as a kind of a leveler for uh, between teacher and student. If you think of uh, asking AI something, that means teacher and student are prompting AI together and they're not, they don't know what AI is gonna produce. Then together they can look at what AI has produced and say, does that make sense? Let's, let's break this apart. The teacher then doesn't have absolute control over what is uh, being produced and becomes a reader and an editor just like their students. We don't have a lot of that happening now. And there are other ways that we might be able to kind of create or, or level. Um, but I think this one, because it's so fast and because it's so responsive and because it's often so wrong, uh, allows for a, a kind of conversation and dialogue where a teacher becomes a participant in the class instead of a leader. And if that happens, a teacher then can model the kind of learning that we want our teachers to model, but that they currently don't model because they feel that they're supposed to be an authority in the classroom. I guess I would just add to that that I am really excited about the ability to do this sort of soft skills training. Um, there's a lot of times, there's many, many interpersonal things that all of us struggle with, things like having difficult conversations, with negative feedback. Um, and those are hard to model often if you do them with real actors or others. But I think that this would allow us to scale up the opportunity to have rare, hard events and practice for them, which is, after all, how we learn. And so I think that there are many cases now, like some of the work that I teach and Jane Sunday and Julia are doing, is how would you have a student, how would you have a teacher, like a, um, a teacher in training, interact with a complicated classroom situation on ChatGPT and set up different personas, and how you have to manage an interaction, um, the ability for us to practice these rare but hard events, I think, could really transform how we interact. You know, it's interesting because we got, uh, thank you, Noah, I think you provided, showing that when we just let the AI do it, it couldn't actually model bad things. <laughs> so um, how do you see where humans in that loop, what, like what are the roles that humans should play in these loops as we use more and more AI? And in particular, what kinds of new skills will teachers or instructors need to learn to be able to, like using your example, uh, Sarah, create uh, uh, example machines. Like, so two, I guess that's a double question. What's the role of humans um, in using the AI? And in particular, if we're using it for example machines, what are new, what are new skills teachers need to learn? 
Yeah, I think the example machine, I'm really excited about the, the AI as an example machine because so much, so often in classrooms, we have time to give one model. Here it is, now you do it. And one is not enough. This is a kind of a, a principle for learning. So, uh, but what this means is that teachers now need to learn to prompt uh, the machine. And um, one of my grad students, Chris Ma and I are uh, just uh, published a blog about this very thing for teachers. It's figuring out, this is, this is going to be a push for teachers too. If uh, teachers now have to learn what kinds of features about, let's say, um, I'll go back to the Great Gatsby essay, uh, because we all wrote one. Um, let's say that uh, the teacher has to learn what features they want kids to pay attention to in a text. Instead of saying, write three examples of a Great Gatsby essay and let's show them all to the kids. They have to say, I want kids to focus on the capacity for uh, data to support a claim or for quotes from the text to support a claim. That's the important thing. So I need to show some non-examples and some examples in a way that will help kids understand that some evidence does not support claims. This is going to be a new thing for teachers to have to think more clearly about what's salient in what they're teaching as opposed to just say, write an essay. Uh, so I think pr prompting is gonna be big. Prompting is gonna become part of what we're teaching in our teacher ed programs. I think on the AI side, I think this really builds on what Noah is bringing up. Uh, these models have huge problems with correctness. Um, and I think things like uh, learning from human feedback, for those of you that don't know the way that at a very high level, the way these large language models work is that there's a lot of supervised learning where you sort of retrain and first you went a little bit. And then one of the really big steps recently is using reinforcement learning, which is something that I and many others work on, which basically uses feedback about which type of responses to prompts are best. And then you use that reward signal to further tune um, what is the type of feedback you like. So I think in these sorts of settings, that's going to be huge, whether it's for sort of training what should a teacher be doing or what would be appropriate responses. Um, and I think one of the encouraging things is it's not always that much feedback you need to provide. I think one thing that I think is an important question there is who is providing that feedback and how is that reward being defined? And right now you can think there are thousands of high school teachers that are all defining their own reward function in my own terminology about how to grade an essay or how to you know um, grade programming assignments. And I think there's a power to that. There's a power to having a distribution of different objective functions. Again, I'm a machine learning nerd, um, as opposed to a single one where if we misspecify that or if it's potentially biased or inaccurate. And so I think when we start to build these, whether we can do it in a local way or whether we can have it reflect a lot of different opinions of what does it mean? To what does it mean to, you know, be able to think critically? Yeah, just to jump in real quick, I think that is one of the problems with ChatGPT as it stands now is, so I'm, I'm maybe being overly optimistic when I say ChatGPT can produce a range of things. We can even prompt it to produce a range of examples and then kids can evaluate them because ChatGPT is still drawing from the internet and it's drawing from all the biases and kind of from the genericness um, that the, the bot creates when it produces. So uh, they're not gonna see a ton of different voices. They're gonna see kind of a, a middle American white newscaster version of an essay uh, five times over. And uh, so we haven't even gotten into kind of the cultural biases uh, and the language biases that the bot may reproduce. And that's something that teachers are going to have to learn to figure out as well. So let's uh, dive a little bit deeper into that question. In what ways can we as the humans uh, structure these or train these or guide these or use humans these to overcome some of those very real current problems? Well, well for me, I spent a lot of my, my career studying how the language that we use in science uh, often intent, intimidates young people. There's oftentimes more new science words in an introductory biology class than there's a, in an introductory Spanish class. And we don't teach the words. Um, many of you may have been like me who use the scientific term uh, without really understanding the idea. So use of the term does not mean you understand the idea. And what a teacher will say, when they, you say condensation, what do you mean? And that secondary question requires the person out being cued to explain without using the language. That's a much harder task, but it's a higher cognitive order. And so part of what I think is challenging is that we communicate, uh, and I'll use the word discourse, broader than that. Discourse is 
any mode of communication. So the way that I'm communicating with my hands, my pace. Uh, when I asked you a question, I was teasing, but many of you were put the went up. You, you, when you, you're not quite sure, you say, maybe, right? Is that is an, an indication that I don't all the way. So part of the language and cognition relationship really undermine teaching and learning. Uh, that has to be a huge step forward, particularly if you add a voice. But what I, what I like about it is a voice can assure you you can get it. A voice can give you confidence or can intimidate you. We, we've done work around clients by all of our videos have British voiceovers. Uh, which is just killing, maybe I don't belong. So I think as a community of, of people who understand language and discourse broadly, embedding cues of belonging and understand how language plays a role in both cognition and motivation, there's a lot of it. On the other hand, maybe just optimistic for a second, but there's a huge potential for these models to reflect different voices. So just like, just like you can generate something in the style of either Swift or Rihanna, like you can, um, there's a way for a lot of these prompts, if you explicitly put it in there, try to reflect diversity or different types of voices. It may not as a default, but there is that potential to go beyond what you might get in standard English textbook. I think in terms of what's considered right, that is a really hard challenge. If we're using these for assessment, then I think that's really important. On the other hand, we have some existing models for doing this, like the Educational Testing Service has had to think about this for essay grading. So I'm not saying to do it perfectly, but we do have some established practices to try to think about what does it mean to be good or what does it mean to assess certain skills um, and to make sure that it's not narrow in that. Um, and I'll just say that uh, it, it may be in, maybe someday, uh, a bot like ChatGPT will be three will be able to or four uh, do some kind of authentic approximation of a of a of a voice other than uh, kind of a Eurocentric uh, representation. Right now, uh, I've just been asking it to write in styles of different authors, including, for example, um, the style of the author of The Hate You Give, which is has an African American protagonist, and the bot right now just pretty much puts yo in front of things. And then it's black, or gets rid of the G on the end of words, and then it's black. So it's it's got a, a long way to go, and I would be nervous for teachers to attempt to kind of represent in that way. To add to that, uh, I, I tried to find research on science teaching and learning around language. What I find is that most of the prototyping around language has to do with uh, GPS systems, and it's very gendered. Like we don't want Bob to say turn right, yard. There's a lot of research that says. People are more responsive to particular voices, but that work is not translated over into educational technology of any sort. So to me, this that's the paradigm of understanding how one is spoken to uh, in a particular digital format has not made its way into this intersection of education. I've lost track completely of time that the session's supposed to go. Do we have some more time for audience questions? Great. Okay, so I'm going to ask you some questions that came in from the audience. Um, so it goes to something we've touched on. How do we adapt assessment of learning to account for student use of AI-generated content? Well, um, I don't know. I think, uh, <laughs> I think the, the first thing is to begin to accept that this tool is here and that kids are going to use it regardless whether uh, we tell them not to. So we want to invite it into, let's say, the classroom. Let's talk about classroom assessment. And the kinds of questions we need to start asking our kids now are, let me know whether you used ChatGPT3 when you were writing this thing um, and to what degree you used it, because that then will determine how I respond. I don't want to waste time telling the bot that it's wrong about its introductory clauses. I'd rather help you and understand what you know by looking at the part you wrote. And if it turns out that you didn't write any of it, well, then probably maybe don't give it to me or you maybe need to go back and. So there's at least some transparency at first and some invitation, some uh, kind of group awareness that this thing is here. Um, and we'll treat it like the tool that it is and ask kids to be honest about when they've used it. And uh, kids, Kids are often more critical than adults of these what they call cheating machines. Uh, so 
I, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's overly optimistic to say that a lot of kids will say, oh yeah, I did use it. I use it for this, this, and this. We just have to invite it. I think. My sense is that. Um... In some areas, one option will be to go back to older ways of assessment. So things like um, in, in our, for our machine learning, we also do oral calls. Literally have people ask students a series of six questions. It's incredibly resource intensive. Um, you can imagine just getting four people into a room that already takes you know, um, an enormous number of emails. Uh, but it is an effective way to try to, and one thing that can be challenging too is to calibrate it. So those exams are consistent. Um, but I think that there's a possibility here that we will start to see more of those sorts of, you know, defend your essay, don't just give me the essay, defend your essay, do essays in class, do um, sort of uh, spot real-time um, assessment quizzes. The challenge with that I see is that that's a really large burden on the grading side or on the assessment side, unless we somehow think foundation models do the assessment in real time. In situation. So I think it's a really big challenge. I think for the of the formative assessment, it's a huge tool. If it's not actually supposed to evaluate the students, it seems that there will be a lot of for the student needs and it's much better. It's gonna uh, it's gonna challenge standardized testing. Um, it's gonna make it's, test makers are gonna have to figure out what it means now to ask a kid to do a task that really what they really want is a ChatGPT produced essay. That is the that is kind of the, the perfection for uh, an SAT or a Regents exam. So it's it's gonna mean something different now to ask for those skills. Yeah, I, I should have disclosed. I'm also on the board of trustees for ETS. So this is a, a big area of discussion. Um, the second question from our audience. Uh, Oh, I like this one. Uh, what are the pros and cons of individualized learning? You know, I, I guess that's, I mean, one of the things people keep saying this is going to make possible is this one-to-one -one tutoring phenomenon, individualized, personalized learning. But that's not, in spite of, <laughs> in spite of that very old study, that doesn't necessarily produce the best learning experience for um, all learners. So what are the pros and cons of individualized learning? I'll start with framework. It, individual learning is better than collective. I'm going to talk in reference to go read the Jerry Walensky's work around group work and the power of that. Situated learning, the idea that we learn by being driven in situations, but we're always benefiting. So there's a framework that I want everybody who's designing to be familiar with. It is a passing framework, a friend of Fonseca and Mississippi State. That the least efficient of mode of learning is what we're doing right now. I'm blabbering, you're doing nothing, I'm passing. Second in the hierarchy of efficiency is active. You're taking notes, like literally verbatim writing what you're saying. Third is you revoicing or restating what, we, what we're saying. And the highest in the hierarchy is a group of people collectively determining what the answer is. So if that is the case, then individual learning versus a group of people decided upon the ideas is a more efficient way of learning because not only do you, do you get to plan, but you also get to critique other people's perspective. It's a deeper learning because it offers the opportunity for you to understand and then evaluate other people's position. So individual learning, unless it's defined to, with some sort of connectedness, it lacks that critical dimension. But I've often seen individual learning framed as completely separate from the teaching phenomenon. It goes back to the teaching phenomenon, which to me is the the big mistake of assuming that individual learning can't stand in support of teachers in the classroom is where I think the natural intersection should be. So I think the limiting factor is also motivation, connectedness. How about I have a great time at school in context with my friends? So you need to assess it more dynamically. So I would argue that the research would suggest <laughs> group learning is more efficient. The challenge is we need to think about how to integrate individual learning in the context. Of those groups. And I would also then say, and the role of the AI in supporting collaborative learning. Last thing I want to say is inverting this process of AI generating outcome or content to the AI producing engagement. It would be a dramatic shift, and I would love to. 
I will just add to that that I think that um, collaborative work is incredibly important, and I'm, I'm not an you know an education researcher, but on the other hand, um, it, we do have collaborative work all the time right now in the one through thirty five in many cases, and in many cases it is not a very effective way to learn. And so I think there really needs, in part, because there's often kids in many different levels of uh, learning, and so in terms of their skill acquisition and uh, stages, and it's really hard to teach students, you know, some of which might be at algebra and others fraction. Very likely that one side will be bored or one side will not be able to engage. So, um, and I also speak as an introvert, so I'm not sure that you know all the time we need to be in dialogue with people for learning. Um, but I do think it's a really important thing, and I think also it's preparation for the rest of their life and, and work is so collaborative right now that we need students that can learn. We may all have different backgrounds, we may all have slightly different skill sets. What can we do together? And on that very positive note. Uh, we'll end our panel. But I, I, I hope this shows that there's a great opportunity for um, all of us in these various disciplines across Stanford to work with each other and tap each other's expertise to come to real solutions. Thanks. Thank you.